Stevia is a common zero calorie sugar replacement found in many zero calorie and diet drinks and other food products like protein powder and granola bars. Reducing the number of calories consumed is favorable for weight loss, but how can a compound act like sugar and have effectively zero calories? There has to be some other health effects, right? I mean, we know that research supports that aspartame, another very, very common sugar replacement, is a carcinogen or a cancer-causing agent. But how about stevia? I talk about this and more, so let's get into the video. What's up everyone, my name is Henrik and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm bringing down a clinical trial studying the effects of daily stevia consumption over 12 weeks on glucose responsiveness and weight loss in healthy adults. This study was published in October of 2020 by Nicoletta Stomatica and others from the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, sugar has calories and consumption of calories is directly correlated to gaining weight. And us humans typically don't like that, in addition to the fact that being overweight is typically unhealthy. Massive companies and researchers have identified many different effectively zero calorie replacements for sugar to help offset the calorie consumption. Some of these include aspartame, acesulfame K, sucralose, and stevia. The first three are synthetic artificial chemicals, while stevia comes from a plant, like sugar does. I also say effectively zero calories because they're not really zero calories. It's technically anywhere from one to 10 calories, but that's typically insignificant. Some of the biggest concerns with these sweeteners are first of all, how can they have a similar effect as sugar like being sweet while being effectively zero calorie? Is there any effect on how your body responds to glucose with insulin? Or does it even cause weight loss? Or what exactly are these chemicals? And can they have other negative side effects? Lots of research has been done on all four of those sweeteners that I've listed. But today I'm talking about the research behind stevia, primarily because it's currently known to be one of the safest for human consumption. Or is it? What you probably don't know is that stevia was originally banned by the FDA for use in, in the 1990s. But why is it so popularly used today in Gatorade products and Coca-Cola products and a lot of other foods? Let's get into it. Looking into the study design, this was a randomized clinical trial studying the effects of stevia in 28 perfectly healthy subjects with an average age of 25. Individuals who are, who are on any diet one month prior to starting the study were excluded. In total, there were two groups, and the 28 participants were split equally into a group that cons consumed stevia and a control group. The control group did not cons consume stevia or anything else. They didn't do anything, anything else differently. So in this case, the control group is not a placebo group. Therefore, the study is not placebo controlled, which is already a massive limitation. The stevia group put five drops of liquid stevia in their drinks twice daily for a total of 12 weeks. And the drinks could have been like tea, coffee, or whatever, whatever the participants wanted. Five drops of liquid stevia is equivalent to one tablespoon of sugar. So subjects consume the equivalent of two tablespoons of sugar daily, which is pretty normal. So basically one group consumed pretty normal amounts of stevia and one group did nothing differently at all. Subjects in both groups were asked to remain consistent with their physical exercise and not to change from their typical normal food consumption patterns. The researchers measured different variables at three different time points or visits, once at the beginning of the study, six weeks into it, and at the end or 12 weeks later. This figure shows exactly what happened and what was measured and when, and it's pretty self-explanatory. The oral glucose tolerance test is used to measure the body's glucose and respective insulin response. Anthropometrics is pretty straightforward. It's like weight measurements. Three-day diet recall is used to measure what foods people ate. And it was actually locked into this cool website that you can check out, intake24.co.uk, link in the description. The International Physical Activity Questionnaire measured physical activity to make sure that was standard. And the appetite questionnaire measured things like how hungry you are in general, or what your cravings are, or if you're craving different things. In summary, the study wanted to see if consuming stevia twice daily for 12 weeks affected your appetite, weight measurements, and body's response to insulin relative to control. All right, I'll preface this and say that the results are super simple on their own, but drawing conclusions and interpretations while looking at other stevia-related studies is where this stuff gets really interesting. The only real significant result, like the only thing that was different between groups, was that the control group actually gained weight and the stevia group stayed the same. And you can see this here in this graph. Now over time, the stevia group also ended up eating less calories by the end of the study by a relatively smaller amount, but this didn't really cause them to lose weight. Nothing else was significant. Not BMI, not blood pressure, heart rate, glucose response, or overall appetite. So stevia didn't really cause any, any change at all. Okay, so this is a super basic study. No major changes at all. The goal of this study was to see if stevia as a sugar replacement caused problems with glucose response or anything like that. 
And the basic conclusion that we see is that when it comes to how your body responds to glucose, stevia is safe. The resulting benefit is that stevia, unlike normal sugar, is effectively zero calorie. And by replacing sugar in the things you eat, or even in things like protein or pre-workout, you minimize calories consumed, which is directly correlated to potential weight loss. This specific ingredient, stevia, which is typically in combination with other harmful zero calorie sweeteners, is one of the biggest reasons why we have lower calorie foods that still have typically high protein content, effectively zero calorie pre-workouts, and lots of different types of diet drinks like Gatorade Zero. Now, if you remember from one of my past videos on artificial sweeteners or sugary drinks, I have talked about aspartame. And a similar type of study from today's found that aspartame didn't affect how the body responds to glucose either. But other studies have begun to really shed light on how aspartame itself is a carcinogen or a cancer-causing agent. And a study from the early 2000s showed that it caused cancer in mice. That's not really good for you. Honestly, big corporations don't even want more studies on aspartame to look into this, primarily because aspartame is such a common and cheap product to use, and they don't want, they want to keep using it. And so that's a completely different discussion. But in that same regard, today's study shows that stevia is relatively safe in respect to glucose. But we have to look at other research to develop a well-rounded consensus on stevia. A 2019 meta-analysis of nine clinical trials looking at stevia consumption found no significant changes in lipids and cholesterol levels or glucose-related measurements like insulin responsiveness. So it seems relatively safe in terms of cholesterol. Now onto the suspicions of stevia as a carcinogen. Unfortunately, these do exist, and in my opinion, this is where the research gets interesting. Three in vitro studies from 1986, 96, and 2020 looked specifically at cells and found that stevia and other derivatives of stevia induced genetic mutations or caused genetic damage or DNA damage, which is typically indicative of cancer or can cause it. Now, a very, very significant thing to note here is that these studies were in vitro studies, meaning they were done in cells as opposed to an in vivo study looking at an animal like a mouse. The results from in vitro studies are typically much more difficult to tie to humans, but they can indicate a start to something. Interestingly, in 1991, the FDA actually banned stevia for human consumption, partially based on that original 1986 study. Three other in vitro studies from 1993, 97, and 2009 studied stevia and looked into this potential mutagenic or carcinogenic effect and found that it did not cause mutations. So these three studies here found the exact opposite result from the three studies previously, basically disproving the concept that stevia is carcinogenic or mutagenic. Now, super interestingly, even more, two in vitro studies from 2012 and 2013 actually found that stevia could help induce cancer cell death, which is really the exact opposite of what those original studies found. So it could even help prevent cancer in some way. If anything, this tells you at least how conflicting research with mice and cells can get. It's definitely not as common with human studies at least from my experience. Looking at actual mouse studies now, a study from 2020 found that stevia didn't induce mutations or cancer in mice. And this is probably the most significant result given that it was in mice as opposed to cells. The FDA reapproved stevia for human food consumption in 2008, and it's been very widely accepted as a sweetener in society. And it's found in a lot of different drinks like Gatorade, vitamin, vitamin water, Sobe, and Coca-Cola and Pepsi products. In short, more recent in vitro studies indicate some safety with some slight cause for concern, but to the best of my knowledge, all in vivo and clinical research studies indicate that stevia is safe to consume and the FDA supports this claim. To me, it seems logical to include stevia if you're looking for a zero calorie sugar replacement, especially given that nearly all the other zero calorie sugar replacements are effectively carcinogenic. I'll definitely make videos on them too. But realistically, a lot of the foods you consume already probably have stevia, especially if you consume protein efficient snacks, protein shakes, or even zero calorie drinks. Looking at a basic summary with some key takeaways, today's clinical trial studied the effects of consuming stevia daily over 12 weeks and found no significant changes in glucose tolerance relative to control. This is a key result since zero calorie sweeteners can draw some concern to insulin related responses as they are a normal sugar replacement. And we can see here that stevia doesn't cause those problems. Other st studies support these claims of not affecting the glucose response but they also look at stevia and how it doesn't significantly affect cholesterol levels, which is a great thing to see. Stevia was originally banned in the 90s for its possible carcinogenic effects, but numerous other, other in vitro studies have proven otherwise, and that's also supported with an in vivo study in mice. And these are some of the reasons why the FDA moved stevia status to generally recognize as safe in 2008. Today, many popular food and drink products like Coca-Cola, Gatorade, teas, coffees, gum, granola bars, protein shakes, and many other products use stevia. 
the real benefit with stevia lies in the fact that it's zero calorie. And if you can offset your daily calorie intake by at least a few hundred calories by switching to stevia instead of sugar, that could lead to steady weight loss over time in itself. And that's important for you to know if that's something you're interested in. Now, there are other zero calorie sweeteners, such as the more popular ones, aspartame and acesulfame potassium or acesulfame K. And but these have some pretty scary research behind them, suggesting they're carcinogenic cancer causing agents. So stevia could be safer. I'm not here to provide medical advice or recommend that you use stevia. That's really not what I'm doing here. Rather, I'm breaking down publicly available research for you to learn and understand what's out there so you can make independent decisions on your own and with your physician. Regardless, that's all I had for today. Check out my description for all the sources and studies I've used and talked about today. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button to support the channel and check out more content. But thanks for watching and have a good one.